Now, if any of these, this theology is carried on, it will be carried on by you one of these days. Because I will be gone. And I will not be here to do this, so it's up to you to carry it on to your children, to your children's children, if the Lord does not come back in the meanwhile. You're the depository. You're the bank account for the Lord. Okay, this is where it's going to come from, right here. Uh, page 43, but before we go into any reading, we're going to go into Genesis, Barashith. Barashith means beginnings, because the book of uh, Genesis is beginnings. Go to Genesis, the uh, if you have your Bibles, Genesis, the, the third chapter. And this is after... Adam and Eve sinned. Of course, the woman was deceived. Adam sinned knowingly and intentionally. And when they took from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, they did not take a little bit. Of, they did, you see in the movies, you see them grab an apple and eat it. That's not what they did. First, it wasn't an apple. But they ate the whole tree. They ate it all. It's, a, it's in the imperfect tense. They took and they ate and they ate and they ate and they gorged themselves. This was, uh, you know, gluttony is a sin, isn't it? They were the first gluttons. They were the first gluttons. And they ate 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 until it was gone. They ate it up. It says Eve took and kept on taking and kept on eating and then she kept on giving to her husband and he kept on eating, kept on eating, kept on eating, kept on eating and kept on eating until I guess it was gone. At all the time they were doing this, they were becoming thieves, they were becoming liars. They were, had be, they were becoming crooked. They were becoming evil. Now... In Genesis, the, uh, the third chapter. And to Adam he said, because of you, because you have listened and given heed to the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree, kept on eating of the tree, that's what it literally says, of which I commanded you, saying you shall not eat of it, nor <coughs> you not, shall not eat of it. The ground because of you is under a curse. The ground, because of you, is under a curse. In sorrow and toil you shall eat of the fruits of it all the days of your life. And remember right here, they were not given animal flesh to eat at all. There's no turkey, uh, Thanksgiving turkey, no ham, nothing like this on the table. There is no, no goat meat, nothing. No hamburgers, no McDonald's, nothing right here. Thorns and thistles. Every time you step on a goat head or get one a, a cockle burr or a sand burr in your foot or whatever, it's because of what Adam did. It's because of what he did. And it shall bring forth to you, and you shall eat the plants of the fields. And in the sweat of your nostrils you shall eat bread, eat food, literally, until you go to the ground. From as to the ground you were taken, and to the ground you shall go. You shall become part of it. You shall become dust. Now go to the Romans, the 8th chapter. Romans chapter 8. And that's where we were reading last week when we, when we left off. Romans chapter 8 and verse number uh, 19. I'm reading from the Amplified Bible, by the way, but I am correcting it as we go from Greek or Hebrew, okay? I'm Ro Romans, the 8th chapter, starting with verse 19. Oh, Genesis 3, uh, whatever I, wherever I was. <laughs> 3, uh, well, uh, I was in Genesis 3, and verse 17 is where I began, okay? And through 19, 317 through 19. Now, when Romans, the 8th chapter, <clears throat> For even the whole creation, all nature, awaits expectantly and longs for earnestly for the sons to be made known. It waits for the revealing, the disclosing of the sonship. For the creation, nature itself was subjected to frailty. Now the ground had become cursed, hadn't it? Because of man. And all the fruits of the ground are cursed because of man. And so now we know that when Cain offered 
the fruits of the ground. He offered a cursed offering from a cursed ground. And of course, he did not tithe. It says he did not cut straight. He did not cut straight. The word in the Greek Septuagint is ortho, which means to cut straight. Now the nature itself has been subjected to frailty, to futility, and condemned to frustration, not because of some intentional part on its fault on its part, but by the will of him who subjected it. Who's that? Adam. With hope. The nature of the creation itself will be set free from, a, from its bondage and decay and corruption and gain an entrance into the glorious freedom of God's children. We know that the whole creation of, uh, of creatures has been moaning the whole creation itself, the ground, the trees, the trees have to suffer. What, was there any uh, boars before this to kill trees? Was there any blight to, to, uh, to kill the wheat or, or, or any of these things? No. So all of creation itself is subjected to the will of Satan today, isn't it? All of the storms, all of the disease and everything that's in the world is because of of Satan and because Adam handed it back over to Satan. He was one time the caretaker of the material creation of God and then he fell and tried to overtake God. It says the creatures and the creation is moaning together in pains of labor until now. And not only the creation but we ourselves too who have and enjoy the first fruits of the Holy Spirit. You that are indwelt by the Spirit of God do you ever get disgusted with your mind and your body? You ever get disgusted with it? You say, man, I, I don't want to live in a body like this. It's terrible. The thoughts I have in this world is horrible. I hate it. Be glad for the resurrection and the changing. The first fruits of the Holy Spirit, a foretaste of blissful things to come, grown inwardly as we wait for the redemption of our bodies from sensuality and the grave which will reveal our adoption, our manifestation of God's sons. For in this hope we are saved, but hope the object of which is seen is not hope. For how can one hope for what he already sees? I am uh, studying on the millennial reign and heaven right now. I'm doing an in-depth study of that. And it's beautiful. It is, it is, uh, it's wonderful. We live in a cursed earth. And it's cursed because of mankind. It's not cursed because of the earth. It's cursed because of mankind. Animals and everything, animals began to uh, kill one another. And all of this after the flood. We're going to get into that a little bit later. People got along. Animals got along before that. What caused the curse? Mankind. All right, now on page 43. The above has reference to the creation as a whole that is cursed by sin. It is pictured as waiting for deliverance, much like the redeemed wait for the deliverance from sin, cursed bodies. Young people, you are young. You haven't hardly, you've hardly started life. Learn from the older people. Read the Bible. You know, the whole Old Testament is given to you for examples of what you shouldn't do. Israel was a rebellious nation, wasn't it? Rebellious. Rebellious. And, and God finally cut them off and set them aside. And they're set aside right now. See, they were dispersed because of their sins, because they killed their king. Their king. They saw the face of the king. They saw the face of the king of glory and their creator. And they murdered him. And they paid for it. They said, let his blood be upon us and our children, and boy, has it been, mm -hmm. and still is. Peter mentions the times of restitution in his address in Acts uh, chapter 3. And he shall send Jesus, which before was preached unto you, whom the heaven must receive until the times of restitution of all things which God has spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. The word restitution, apokatasios, comes out of the Greek word apokatasios, of which Harper's 
analytical Greek lexicon says, a restitution or a restoration of a thing to its former state. Hence, the renovation of a new and better era. How many of you ever had a cold? How many of you ever had pain? A bellyache? All of these things? Backache? We have all of these things. In heaven, you won't have any of that. Never any indigestion. <laughs> Isn't it going to be wonderful? Revelation 21, 8 and 27 tells of the banishment of forever of the master deceiver Satan into the lake of fire. It is shown, first of all, in the very first part of the chapter, it says that Satan will be put into a bottomless pit and locked up in jail for a thousand years. Achilia on Achilia Eter, or Millianum, a thousand years. That's the thousand year reign over here. This is what he's talking about, this millennial reign. He's going to be locked up down there, Revelation 27 through 9, or 7 through 8, in the, uh, or 9, in the bottomless pit. He will be set aside. And on this earth will live a, a thousand years of people that will, will be born and live, and some of them die, but they're going to live long times during that period of time. They're going to live long lives like Adam would have lived in the garden, like Noah lived, like Methuselah lived. But you know what? They're going to still going to have problems. Who made Adam sin? What made Adam sin? Was it really the devil? Did the devil really make him do it? No. His rebellion made him do it. The Satan does not have any redemption plan, does he? The angels cannot be redeemed. The fallen spirits cannot be redeemed. We call fallen spirits demons. Daimonia, which means little gods, the supernatural beings, and which are around us. They bother us all the time. We have supporting spirits. This is what we call ministering spirits. We have guardian angels, and we have hell-bound fallen angels. You know, as God's people have fallen have, have angels that support you and, and protect you. Do you know that some of Satan's people, some of his great heroes, have fallen angels and spirits ministering to them and guiding them and inspiring them to do evil deeds? Behind every evil government that's ever been established are fallen angels. Read the book of Daniel. Read the book of Job. If you want to see how Satan and, and his emissaries can bother you. And you experience some of this, don't you? Maybe. Huh? Do you ever experience some, experience some of this? <coughs> Throughout the Bible, the earth is a central scene of action in God's universe. It is the scene of conflict between God and Satan and the battleground where faith and unbelief vie. The earth was the scene of Lucifer's dethronement and the enthronement of man as a master. How many Edoms were there in the Bible? How many Edoms? How many Edoms? Marilyn, how many Edoms? Two Edoms. One, and Eden is always a throne room. A throne room. Now we see a throne room in heaven and the whole floor of that throne room is made out of one great piece of diamond. It's called a crystal sea. That is a piece of polished diamond and what do diamonds do they reflect the glory and all the colors around them and that's where we see the rainbow throne of God and all this all the colors are being reflected from that diamond floor a diamond polished diamond floor if you can even imagine such a thing and on there sits the king of glory and the author of our salvation and all of his glorious attributes are reflected by that diamond floor. We have a carpet down here. Imagine a diamond floor with Jesus standing up here in all of his glory. And we see his attributes and how that he saved us. And yet we see the scars in his hands. That's the only one. You know, you're probably not going to have any scars or anything when you go to heaven. You're going to be perfect. I've got, got scars all over me from horse prints and everything you can think of. Bullets, knife wounds, <laughs> explosions. 
<laughs> crushes, <laughs> everything you can think of. And I kept the angels busy because I wouldn't be here. Next week, if I remember right, I'm going to bring a gun out here that exploded in my hand. And you tell me how I was alive after that happened. It was an explosion like a grenade and holding it in your hand and not throwing it. That's what happened. I'm here. I almost got my finger blown off. That was the only thing that happened. That's, I'm left-handed. That's my trigger finger. See? It was blown to pieces. From there out was nothing but hamburger. They put it back together. And it works a little bit. <laughs> We see this. These are spiritual activity in the physical world. Spirits have no limitations. They can go from dimension to dimension. We are locked here in this little physical world we call this, and we call this the normal world. When we talk about somebody having abnormal behavior, or we talk about paranormal, paranormal means outside of normal. Paranormal activity is something that... Uh, is uh, in the spiritual world, not in the physical world, beyond physis or beyond the physis, physical world. Physic, physis comes from the word physical in Greek. Physis. That's the physical world. This is beyond physical. We, we get our word physical from that Greek word. God's commission to man and to people was to people the earth and have dominion and subdue it. When he said have dominion, have sovereignty over it, what did it mean there, Brother Ray? Do you remember? That's, that, that made man in, in, he has volition, doesn't he? Man has volition. And he has sovereignty over his eternal being like God has sovereignty. In other words, God created man's sovereign will. Now we have these animals. Now according to this, do the animals, does the creation itself long to be redeemed? Does it have volition? Do animals have souls? The Bible says, says in, the book of Gen in the book of Genesis that animals have basar. Say basar. 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 And in Greek it's sarx. And in Latin it's carne. And in Spanish it's carne. That means flesh. And it says they are ruach. Say ruach. 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 Ruach is spirit. In Greek, that's pneuma. And we have pneumatic tools. How many of you have used a pneumatic tool? An air grinder, a impact wrench, or something like that. That's pneumatic run by air. That, it, ruach means air or spirit. Pneuma means air or spirit. And then we have uh, we have nephish. All animals, they are living nephishes. Nephish. Nephish means soul. It's psyche in Greek. Psyche. We got our word psychology. That's the study of the soul. In the soul is memory. In the soul is volition. In the soul is understanding. And in the soul is evil. That's where it comes from. So animals have basar, they have ruah, and they have nephish, just like man does. Now, I don't understand all about that. All I can tell you is that what the, that's what the Hebrew Bible says. And so many people don't understand that very point because they don't know Hebrew. We need to go back to these basics, learn these things. At least remember this, stick it under your hat. Maybe you can understand it 30 or 40 years from now. I told you that 35 years ago, didn't I, Brother Ray? Did it work? Stick it under there. About 30 or 40 years, you'll understand it. You'll begin to understand it sometimes. It takes a long time to understand the Bible. I understand more about the Bible today than I ever did any other time in my life. I continue to study it. Subdue it. It has met with Satan's opposition every step of the way. Satan has exerted all his unseen power to thwart God. He is literally the God of this world in, first, in 2 Corinthians 4 and 4 and also the prince and the power of the air in Ephesians 2 and 2. It, the, the book of Ephesians says we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but what? Spiritual world grabbers. That's what it literally says. Spiritual world grabbers. World grabbers. 
World. What's world? Cosmos. The prince and the power of air, Ephesians 2 and 2. God has purposed to oust Satan, this usurper, once for all, and bring his creation into harmony with himself once again in Revelation 20 and 10. The earth will be the locality of this final scene. The first Eden was the throne room of Satan. The second Eden which God built was the throne room of man. And man just handed it over back over to Satan. So guess who ruled in, in Eden again? And God shut off Eden, didn't he? He put a, a cherubim there. Cherubim, by the way, there's more than one. On the Ark of the Covenant, there were two cherubim, one on each side. Cherubim are angels that have wings. That's all I can tell you. And they're supernatural beings. And they're physical beings because angels have, have, mature, angels have a material body. Spirits do not. I want you to get some of this stuff. I mean, this is deep stuff here, but you, I want you to get it. Many books are written about angels, and they don't understand anything about angels. I can go and get you ten books that tells you that angels don't have bodies. But angels have bodies. They, are, they have material spiritual bodies that, that can pass through dimensions. Angels are always physical. They have form. Spirits do not. Spirits seek to dwell in human or animal flesh because they are what we call unclothed beings. Angels are clothed. Angels are clothed. At one time, man was clothed with glory. How many of you like to get, how many of you girls especially like to get fancy, pretty clothes? I know, you, Peyton, you made a dress for yourself, didn't you? Yeah. You like to look pretty and everything. Do you know that, that when God clothed man in glory in the original, how could you have better things than glory? It says in the Bible that Solomon, all of his beauty, couldn't clothe his kingdom like he, God clothed the, the little flowers of the prairie. The whole universe, the whole course of Revelation moves toward the goal of a perfect creation ruled by perfect man. In willing subjection to the perfect God, God will bring this into pass, bring this to pass over every obstacle of sin and rebellion, and his praises shall be sung by the multitudes of the redeemed, who reign with Christ forever and ever. The great eternal purpose of God will be accomplished in creation, and God will remain true to himself and every principle of his attributes. In Revelation, the fifth chapter, verse 18 to 10, And when he, Christ, had taken the book, the four beasts and four and twenty elders fell down before the Lamb. The Lamb there is Christ, Jesus. Having every one of them harp in a golden vials full of odors, which are the prayers of the saints, and they sang a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof, for you were slain and have redeemed us to God by your blood out of every kindred, every tongue. Every kindred there means every nation, every tongue, and the people and nation, and has made unto us God a kingdom of priests, and we shall reign on earth. Revelation 5, 8 through 10. Creation is not an accident, and God has a goal to which he will bring his creation. Man has an eternal stake in this purpose of God. The order of restoration of the earth is found in Genesis 1, 1 through 9, illustrates the spiritual history of the believer in Christ Jesus. Now, I want to share something with it. This is jumping way ahead into the millennium. There are three different ideas of the millennium. There's all millennium, what we call all, all millennialism, which do not believe in a millennium at all. There are postmillennialism, and there are what we call premillennialist. Now I'm a premillennialist because the Bible made me that way. All millennialists and postmillennialists have a an idea that man is so good that one of these days that by the gospel of God and they misinterpret two parables that Jesus gave the parable of the mustard tree and the parable of the leaven leaven in the Bible is always a, 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 a type of what? Sin. sin 
But now these amillennials and postmillennials say leaven is a type of the gospel. And that the gospel will permeate the whole world. And that the whole world will be brought to Christ one of these days because of the gospel. And that mankind, because of his brilliance that God has given him, he will make everything, the inventions of mankind, will get be better and better. They will, they, they will, men will live longer lives. The world will become a better place. Men will become civilized. The Southern Baptist Convention in the early 1900s, before World War I, in the late 1800s, started a program. They said, if you give us, I believe it was a $9 million program, they said, if you give us $9 million, we will evangelize the whole world and we will bring in the millennium. And this is what we call post-millennialism. Okay? We will bring in the millennium. In other words, the church is going to go right straight from here into the millennium. We're going to bypass the, the, the tribulation and the restoration of the Jewish people on the earth. We're going to bypass all of that. And we're going to, and this is what you also call rest, uh, rest what we call uh, re replacement theology. Replacement theology. Well, it's not biblical. You have to spiritualize the scriptures. You have to take places in the Bible and you have to make them spiritual things. In other words, there's not really going to be a millennial reign of Christ on the earth. That's not really going to happen with all millennials. But, what, but what's going to happen is that God's going to rule in the, in the hearts of God's redeemed. And it might take a million years before the millennial really comes, but in all things, God's going to, he's going to really rule, and everybody on the earth, or nearly everybody on the earth, is going to be converted according to that philosophy. The difference between the premillennials, the amillennials, and postmillennials is the interpretation of the Bible. The Bible really says what it says. Literal interpretation of the Bible. Does the Bible say there's going to be literally a millennium? Yes. Millennium is a thousand years. And they say that the word millennium is not in the Bible. Well, it's 1,000 years. That's what millennium is, 1,000 years. Millianum, that comes from the Greek. It's kilia eter in Greek. The Latin, that is, is millianum, a thousand years. It's a thousand year reign of Christ. And they try to say that when Jesus came, he, he bound Satan and put him in the bottom of the pit. Is Satan around? Is he still here? Do you think he's still here? Do you think he's in the bottom of the pit yet? No. Just answer some of these very simple questions. Now let's go on because we're talking about this a little bit. The account of creation and the restoration is a fact and is not to be spiritualized away. That's why I brought that in parenthetically. Spiritualizing away scriptures. The writer found this outlining among his notes and it is passed on for spiritual value that may be gleaned from it. This is placed just here at the close of chapter of creation that the believer might be remain might be reminded again of his spiritual standing of the past, present, and future. The Genesis account of the earth furnishes an illustration. If by chance an unsaved person reads these lines, may sufficient be said to awaken an interest in eternal things. Verse number one. In the beginning God created heaven and earth. Now there's quite a little bit of difference between what that says in Hebrew. It's Barashith bara Elohim Yathashimayim with Yathaharitz in Hebrew. In one of the beginnings, God had created the heavens and the earth. The heavens, by the way, means the whole universe. Just take that word heavens there and say whole cosmos, whole universe, and then he took the earth and placed it in exactly the right place. A, coming uh, fresh from the hands of the Creator, the, the original creation must have presented a scene unequaled for splendor and beauty. Nothing to mar, no enemy of God. Uh, creation singing in harmony with its Maker, God reigning supreme. In beginning, God created man, Genesis 2 and 7. Man 
had no sinful past, no deceit, no wicked heart. God didn't create anything evil or wicked or crooked or imperfect. I want you to understand that. When the Jews went off into the Babylonian captivity, they came back with the idea that God had created a chaos because the Babylonian idea of creation is God created chaos and that he brought order out of chaos. But that is absolutely diametrically opposed to the purpose and the, and the mind of God himself. God doesn't create anything imperfect. He doesn't create chaos. He created perfection and out of it became chaos because of Satan. The earth had no sinful past, did it? When man was created, did he have a sinful past? Now, if you're a Mormon, you might say that. Or if you're a reincarnationist, you might say that, that maybe you were some bad spirit in, in they believe, the reincarnation, the Rosicrucians, uh, this New Age people, all of this, you know, Buddhism. All of these talk about a, what we call reincarnation of beings that have floated around for millions of years and they're reincarnated. And you're one of those reincarnated beings. Last time you might have been a horsefly or a maggot or an earthworm or a tiger or a lion or an elephant. They believe that. They really believe this stuff. Or you might have been a fish in the sea. You might have been a whale. Whatever. Now, we don't have any sinful past when we're brought into this world when God created man. Man had no sinful past, no deceit, wicked heart. He had no depraved nature, no disappointments. He knew no sorrow, no corruption, no broken fellowship. He was innocent and happy in the Garden of Eden, which, much as the earth enjoyed freedom from the curse of sin in the original creation. Verse 2. And the earth was became uh, without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. Let me read that to you so you can hear what it sounds like in, in Hebrew, okay? We haris haya tohu avohu. We hoshek el pene tahom. We ruah Elohim, Mary Pachet, El Penei Hamayim. That's what it says in Hebrew. So you saw these Hebrew writings. Now let's look and see what it says. And the earth, the earth was. Now every time you come to the word was in the first chapter of the book of Genesis, mark it out because it's not what it means. You put became there. Not was, but became. The earth became, and light became, and darkness became, and something caused it. Something caused it to become. The judgment had fallen. Light was quenched. Darkness ruled. The fair work of God was blasted. It was a scene of ruin and helplessness. This is a picture of fallen man. As a creation... Man did not remain in its original state of purity. A dreadful catastrophe occurred, Romans 5 and 12. Instead of obedience, there was insubordination and rebellion. Instead of life and joy, there was death and sorrow. How aptly the chaotic earth pictures the fallen state of mankind. Man is not as God made him, Ecclesiastes 7:29. The heritage of the human race is that man is now born with a breach upon his understanding, Ephesians 4 and 18. You're born separated from God, but you're under his atonement until you come to the age of accountability. And, of course, we, the superlapsarians, the anth what we call the antilapsarians or the superlapsarians, and some of the infralapsarians don't believe. They believe that God created some people to be damned and he created others to be elected. What is that saying about God? Did God create evil? Did he ever create evil? Did he ever create something to be damned? No, it's contrary to the nature of God. See, I want you to get shut of that stuff because it's very popular today. <clears throat> Verse 2. And the Spirit of God moved, brooded, fluttered, mourned over, suffered over, is what it literally says. 
the faces of the waters. So long as God's Spirit works, there is hope. The Genesis 1 and 2 tells you about the whole plan of creation. God suffers over, mourns over. When, how many of you know, remember the time you were saved? The Spirit of God was troubling over, suffering over your heart. The Spirit of God did not want to see you go to hell. And you were on your way to hell, so Spirit God was mourning over your soul, and Spirit God was calling your soul to salvation. And, and God's tears were falling as God's tears were falling over the suffering of the creation. Because there's something about mankind that there is volition there, there's sovereignty there that God won't go beyond that. How many times have God's people made God cry? How many times have lost people that God has called them that he's made God mourn as he did on Genesis 1 and 2? Think about that. These are deep things of God. You won't learn this in seminaries today, hardly. <laughs> they wouldn't be hyper-Calvinists that they would if they teach this, this very course right here. They'd know who God is. God is not a creator of evil. He's not a creator of the damned. Neither did God abandon man. The fact that God took note of Adam after his rebellion is due to a sovereign mercy, not to any merit on Adam's part. Fallen man is in himself a helpless creature helpless as the chaotic earth was. He cannot regenerate himself. This must be accomplished by God. God redeems man by his grace. The Spirit's method is by conviction, leading to repentance. And when the conviction re repents and puts his trust in Jesus Christ, he is regenerated or born again. Verse 3, And God said, Let there be light, and light was and then there was light no and God said let there become light and light became when you're born again light becomes in you it turns the light on you have a knowledge and a conviction of sin and and good from evil don't you do you want to do good do bad when you're saved you may do bad you may do the wrong things you may sin when you're saved and sinners say, uh, save people sin. I don't know whether you can get by a day without sinning unless you're in some monastery, some Catholic monastery, where they don't believe that, but they are sinners. Yeah. It's the same as all. The Buddhists are sinners. Yeah, they are. We are sinners. There was first the uh, activity of the Spirit accompanied by the spoken word. Ten times in this recorded in this chapter, and God said, and he might be refrained from speaking with refashioning without saying anything. It is intimidated that his purposes and counsels are to be worked out and accomplished by his word. His word is a statement. His word is law. His word is law. His word is law for him and for man. God cannot break his own law, can he? He cannot break his own law. God fenced himself in. He cannot break his own law. Also in the work of the new creation, new birth, there is the activity of the Holy Spirit and the ministry of the word working hand in hand. Romans 10, 17, Psalm 119, one, verse 130. Verse number 4 says, And God divided the light from the darkness. Light. Light from darkness. Light is opposite of a darkness in this. And the Holy Spirit rescued the earth from darkness. And he divided the light from darkness. And those who trust in Jesus, Hebrews 4 and 12, the earth was brought into light, which pictures fellowship with God. 1 John 1, 5 through 7. In the work of redemption, a regeneration from darkness takes place. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Well, we live in a dark world, don't we? Do we not? We live in a world that is addicted to sin and rebellion. First Corinthians, Second Corinthians five seventeen. This forms a basis for the life of separation in the experience of a Christian. Verses six through eight. The firmament made, and this is the first time it is stated that God made something. God makes new creation creatures in Christ Jesus by His Spirit 
and by his word in 2 Peter 1, 4 and James 1, 18 and 1 Peter 1, 23. This is not a work of reformation. It is not a work of reformation. You don't reform yourself. God recreates you. You have a new creation in you, that spirit. Verses 9 through 11, a record of God's work on the third day. Three is the number of the resurrection. The earth was raised from the waters, and seed was caused to bring forth after its kind. Now, there was already seed there, wasn't it? God didn't create seed there. The seed was already there from the original creation. So God is causing life to become again from what was destroyed. Can a tree grow without the sun? No. You have to have the sun. Was there, any, was there any light? Was there any sun shining here? No. So God had put the original, some plants that we have in this world. How many of you know what a pomegranate is? Do you know that that's one of the oldest fruits in the world? That, that fruit has not been genetically changed. It's one of the oldest original fruits in the world. The figs go back to the Garden of Eden. They may go all the way back in the original creation. <coughs> Pomegranates and figs. Some theologians thought that with the pomegranate what they took. That's what you're say that. Yeah. <laughs> but no. How many of you ever ate a pomegranate and got the knowledge of good and evil? <laughs> you already have it. Christ's seed planted in us will raise us to glory because and calls us to be brought forth in bodies that fashioned like his glorious body in Philippians 3.21. At salvation we are raised spiritually to walk in newness of light and life. At the resurrection we shall be raised to live in a newness of life and eternally bring forth fruit unto God. God desires to show his love because he is love. There must be that object of to love. God created a creation to love it. Does God love the world? What verse in the Bible can you prove to me that God loves the world? Where can you go? Where? John 3, 16. For God is the love of the world. His creation. And we get that and we just forget about the world, don't we? And we start applying it to people. It's talking about the whole cosmos, the whole world. He loves the world. And he created the world to, to love and to love him back. Do you think the trees obey him? How about, the, how about the flowers? Do they try to change and do things they're not supposed to? They just follow the order of things, don't they? Stay right on track. Stay right on track. Therefore, God is love, hence the creation is an object to bring him as love and creatures capable of understanding that love by observation and experience. Why did God make man? Why did God make man? To praise him and love him. He made man in his image, didn't he? It says God in Genesis 1.26, he made man in his shadow casting likeness, his spiritual likeness in his blood flowing likeness and according to his sovereign likeness. Man is sovereign like God. That's what it says there. God made man. God made people to love and things to bring glory to himself. What man has done so many times in this world is destruction in it. We can look back and see all kinds of destruction. If man has ever loved, it is, a, it is a repetition of what God has already done. Do you ever know anybody that, that absolutely loved you? Unconditionally loved you? Or do you know unconditional love? That's what we understand about God. That volition in you, in a person that shows unconditional love and forgiveness, is something that emanate, emanates God. It emanates God.
Now we're on page number 49. Now I don't want to get too far away from these others, okay, because some of them had to leave. I don't want to get too far away from that. But we'll start back here in chapter number 3 next week, and we'll study about God's eternal purpose revealed in mankind. God's eternal purpose revealed in mankind. Mm-hmm. All right. Thank you for attending today. I hope you learned something from God's Word. Let's be dismissed with prayer. Young lady, would you mind dismissing us in a prayer? Is that all right? Yes. Thank you, Father, for this time.